I welcome you all in the second edition of Orange City Literature Fest, which is organized by CGR Knowledge Foundation. I am Prachi Chandigar, your anchor for this session. This session is of 40 minutes, and the topic of the session is History of Desire in India. I am very pleased to welcome the speaker of the session, Madhvi Menon, ma'am. Mom is a professor of English and director for the Center of Studies in Gender and Sexuality at Ashoka University. Her most recent book is titled Infinite Variety, A History of Desire in India. And she is currently at work on finishing a book, The Law of Desire. We welcome you, ma'am, for the session. Now, I shall introduce the moderator of the session, Parkha Mathur Ma'am. Ma'am is a senior journalist for the English dailies in the city for over two decades. Being a feature editor of Times of India, she has covered a large segment of subjects which include trends, lifestyle, art, music, and culture. From features to interviews of celebrities and stirring stories of big achievements by ordinary persons have all been a part of her writings. She is also a columnist, blogger and author and has taught writing to students of mass communication. She has also conducted workshops and creative lighting and is a popular panelist at literary events. We welcome you, ma'am, and the session is over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Prachi. Thank you. Ma'am, Madhuri ji, should we? Of course, Harsha, thank you. So a very warm welcome to you and uh, to the audience who are watching us. I would just like to in, tell them that you explore desire in the Indian context, you know. You wade through religion, history, India's culture, ethos. In the cinema and contemporary society to speak about desire. Am I right there? And yes. So, uh, Ira, I'm also very, very interested, you know, I mean, in the, your writings and the way you are handling this subject. But most of what I was doing, a, uh, you know, study about you, and I, I understand that you interpret desire in the sexual form mostly, you know, I mean, is it so, ma'am? Um, yes, and 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 Barkha, please call me Madhvi. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, I sort of when I when someone says ma'am, I look around to see who is being talked about. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Who has been talked about? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, I mean yes and no, which is to say the reason I use the word desire in the title of my book, the reason I'm interested in the idea of desire, mm -hmm. is that on the one hand it can certainly be seen or understood as being synonymous with sexuality or seen or understood as being synonymous with sort of acts of genital sex or physical acts of sex. Right. On the other hand, as the word itself suggests, it is also something that cannot be contained or uh, encapsulated only within the desire or in, within the category of physical sex. Yeah, yeah. It also indicates something extra, something excessive, something can, that, that cannot be contained, um, which is why, of course, I'm attracted to the idea of desire. Uh, because it suggests multiple things. It suggests multiple facets and it's multiple sort of points of entry into thinking about these matters. Because I think one of the one of the things that interests me the most and one of the arguments I make in this book um, is that uh, desire is not immediately recognizable to us. That it's not immediately something that we can define. True. You know, which is why you, your first question to me also is exactly about that. Mm -hmm. The question of definition, uh, what, do, what do we mean by desire? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it is precisely that sort of difficulty with definition that attracts mm -hmm. me to the idea of desire. So yes, mm -hmm. it is sexuality in terms of physical sex, but also it is not, or it is not mm -hmm. only. True. True. And, uh, if, we, if we see Indian mythology, scriptures, history, they are replete with incidences which have been triggered uh, from desire, you know or by desire. In fact, uh, it was one of a very celebrate, celebrated aspect of uh, the Indian way of uh, life. But from being a society that celebrated desire and believed in satisfying it, how did we become so regressive as a society where we are almost asked to suppress our desires? Yeah. How did that come about? That's the million rupee question, huh, Barkha? 
Um, and it's a very good question. And it's a question that I often ask myself. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a question I often discuss with my students who also have interesting ideas on the subject. Yeah. Um, you see, you're absolutely right, which is that for uh, thousands of years, we have had histories in the Indic subcontinent that will put to shame people in the West today as well. I mean, we have had really um, elaborate, open, interesting, intricate uh, webs of desire that we have spun, whether it be in uh, terms of sculpture, of course, everyone knows the sculptures on the temples of Ajaraho or Konarak or any number of places, whether be it be in terms of poetry, everyone knows about Sufi poetry and how um, sort of, you know, uh, homoerotic it is, whether it be in the form of mythology, everyone knows the sort of multiple stories of um, uh, Hindu gods and goddesses and the mischief that they all get up to, uh, whether it be in the realm of philosophies. I mean, there are multiple realms in which one can see for thousands of years in India a certain comfort with desire in all its multiplicity uh, that we seem to have completely stepped away from, completely stepped back from. One of the ways in which we can think about this, and again, as I said, this continues to be a puzzle, so I don't want to pretend like I have the answer. So all I'm going to do is sort of make a few suggestions for us to think about it. And one of the ways to think about it, of course, is to say that we can date this kind of retardation or regressiveness, to use your word. Uh, this regressiveness in terms of desire, we can date it from the start of the colonial period and of colonialism uh, and the sort of entry of a certain kind of British prudery uh, in yeah. India, where, you know, as, um, as a lot of people have reminded us, the British were so prudish by the time they came to India that even the legs of their pianos had to be covered because legs were never meant to be uncovered, right? I mean, that's how prudish they were. And so they come to India and without doubt impose a certain regime of sexual prudery uh, on multiple fronts, right? So for instance, they convert the centuries long uh, Tawayaf and Devdasi traditions, they, they transform all that into prostitution. Uh, they transform the vibrant culture of non-binary genders, um, Hijra, Kinas, all these communities in the Indic subcontinent they convert them into eunuchs and criminalize them. They, in fact, pass a law called the Criminal Tribes Act in 1871. So yes. on multiple fronts, they insist, for instance, that everybody, all men and women, have to get married. And marriage was by no means a done deal or something that was accepted in all parts of the subcontinent. So on multiple fronts, they introduced a whole lot of um, regressive, from our perspective, from the Indic perspective, a whole lot of, exactly, yeah. exactly. A whole lot of regressive ideas. Mm -hmm. But I must qualify this at this point to say, while all this is true, the reason why the British were able to be so successful at this imposition is precisely because they found uh, certain fault lines within the Indic civilizations itself that they were able to exploit. The biggest fault line, of course, that they were able to exploit is something that continues to haunt us today, which is the idea of caste. Okay. And as you know, as we all know, unfortunately, caste mm -hmm. is premised on an idea of purity and impurity. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a question of uh, who is in my caste is pure, who is outside my caste is impure. The lower caste will perform the impure tasks, the upper caste will perform the pure tasks. And as you can imagine, this idea of purity and impurity sat very well with an idea of sexual prudery. Because then you immediately sort of say, all this other than reproductive, heterosexual, married sex is impure. And then you start sort of vilifying all of that rather than valorizing it. Oh. So this worked with a lot of sort of divisions that they found within the Indic cultures itself to sort of, you know, elevate their sense of purity. And so much so that if you trace it down and you come to someone like Vivekananda, who at the turn of the 19th century, publishes, you know, his Raja Yoga, which is uh, still a very popular book. And Vivekananda is, is a sort of ascendant figure in Indian politics today. So much so that, as you might have read, the controversy over the installation of a statue of Vivekananda in JNU just last week. And, and for me, that is sort of an interesting development because Vivekananda very much, I think, marks that marriage or that fusion 
between a certain kind of caste purity on the one hand and British morality on the other hand. And he brings it together to talk in this language of purity that his descendants, um, especially people who think they know about Hinduism today or talk about Hindutva today, his descendants are uh, making or trying to make um, mm -hmm. normal as the way we were. And it is not the way we were. It is very much a sort of um, very carefully crafted version um, of a certain mm -hmm. kind of British morality that we've inherited. So there are multiple mm -hmm. strands that go into even beginning to think about your question because it's such a rich mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if we just stick to this Hindu way of life or the Indian way of life, so then that advocates some level of renunciation also. Indulgences, especially the sexual ones, are looked down upon. So how do you explain that? You know, I mean, uh, going big backwards, you know, from the colonial time, Hindu religion, we are made to believe, really looks down upon these cravings, this degeneration or decadence or whatever it may be. So, how, how, how do you so, but of course, I want to sort of uh, usefully disconnect the <laughs> phrases of Indian way of life and Hindu way of life, because those are not synonymous and not the same thing. And I'm interested in the sort of Indic way of life, sort of in the subcontinent in general, because okay. of course, as we know, what we call India today is a fairly recent phenomenon. You know, it's just sort of since the British, I, I, since the British yeah. left, and it's a sort of geo, geopolitical <laughs> territory. Um, and so, uh, so then to go, but your question then is specifically about a certain history of Hindu traditions in, yes. this, uh, in the subcontinent. Yeah. Um, and in relation to that question, um, I, mean, I don't, I, I, you know, you know as well as I do, and I don't need to rehearse necessarily, that if you look at any number of our Vedic texts, if you mm -hmm. look at uh, the Kama Sutra, even the Manusmriti, which is obnoxious in so many ways, the mm -hmm. idea of a certain kind of sexual licentiousness, I mean, the Manusmriti speaks openly about women having sex with women, men having sex with men. Um, these are not ideas that are imported from the West later, you know, thousands of years later. They're very yeah. much part of our past. Uh, you will remember, of course, the myth of why Brahma has four heads. Um, and yeah. the idea is that he was lusting after his daughter and couldn't bear to have her out of his sight. So he grew heads mm -hmm. in all directions so he could keep an eye on her at all times. Now, I mean, these are just sort of a few of thousands of millions of such stories. And so mm -hmm. to suddenly say that we are not like that has to mm -hmm. make us question, who is this we? And when we yeah. say, who is this we, then we mm -hmm. go back to what I was just saying earlier, which is this we becomes the sort of corrupted, bastardized mm -hmm. version of a certain kind of British um, uh, morality with a certain kind of caste purity to craft mm -hmm. this kind of uh, culture mm -hmm. that is fairly mm -hmm. new but that we are assuming is thousands of years old. Ma'am, uh, and, and um, see, you use a lot of examples from the deities, the mythological figures uh, from our scriptures to speak about uh, sex and homosexuality, you know. I mean, so much so that I was reading one of the, your write-ups and even this Trump visit, you know, you had this <laughs> masculine yeah. thing to it. So, and surprisingly, you, your writings are never frowned upon, you know. How do you manage that, you know? I mean, is it the inherent truth there or what is it? That, you know? well, I, Barka, I think the easy answer to your question is that not many people read it. So that's why... No, no, I mean, <laughs> let us not believe that, you know. I mean, uh, you know how it goes today, you know. We, yes, it, writers are sitting ducks. I do. I do know that. And, and it is it is scary. I will, you know, I will not lie to you. It is frightening. It can be... Uh, we all know, you know as well as I do, that we are taking a risk every time we speak. We are taking yes. a risk every time we write. Um, and I, I'm fully aware of that, but I feel my confidence cannot permit me not to write. But also I write about things that I find, um, that I, I think there's a huge gap between mm -hmm. what we are told to believe Yeah and the sort of uh, truth of our histories, the conditions on the ground that completely militate against that. So this article that you're referring to, uh, Trump's visit to India, and I was talking about how he played his signature tune, which is Macho Man, uh, which is a song by um, 
by uh, you know a, a famous, famous <laughs> absolutely a famously uh, gay group uh, from mm. the, uh, from the eighties in the US. Which and is so, subsequently it, not on the internet anymore. Exactly, and so so my question was. Trump and Modi, both of whom present themselves as being so robustly heterosexual, uh, what do we do then when they play a song about machismo, which they both want to embody, but machismo from a gay male perspective? And so part of what I find interesting there is that they have no clue where this is coming from. Right? They just want to be macho. And so that, that part is actually funny. And on the other hand, this idea that these kinds of narratives of sexuality are always intertwined with each other. And so to go back but to your earlier question, which I just re remember I didn't address about uh, renunciation and about asceticism, uh, which you know, again is sort of, you know, so many people are talking about today. It's very, very interesting that um, renunciation was actually never part of Vedic literature, never. It only started to become popular with the Buddha and with Mahavira because they were reacting against what they called or viewed as Brahmanical Vedic cultures, right? There was yeah. no such term as Hinduism. The word Hindu did not exist. There was no such thing. They were respond, reacting against Brahmanical Vedic culture and they said, this is all just too much attachment. We will preach a path of renunciation. So the idea of renunciation is a Buddhist and Jain idea, not a Vedic idea at all. But yeah. what I found in my research is just sort of fascinating, which mm. is that apparently tens of thousands of people mm. found this idea so attractive that they flocked to the Buddha and they flocked to Mahavira and sort of said, you know, we are renouncing Vedic um, uh, Brahmanism, what Yogi Adityanath today would call love jihad, right? And they were going over to become Buddhists or become Jains. <laughs> And the Vedic uh, Brahmins were so perturbed by this that they said, OK, and they came up then with that fourfold path of life. You know, the student, the householder, uh, mm -hmm. the sort of um, forest dweller and then the ascetic. Mm -hmm. They came up with that fourfold path of life in competition with Buddhism. Mm -hmm. so they said, You come back to us and we'll give you two of those stages, three stages, actually, because it's okay. also meant to be an ascetic. Mm -hmm. Three of those four stages we will give you as stages of asceticism. Mm -hmm. And it's only the householder stage where you will need to have sex and reproduce and, you know, produce more little Vedic brown. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other three we can, we can give you off. So it seems to suggest, interestingly, that there actually has been a long fascination with asceticism. Okay. But that fascination was not a Vedic fascination at all. Quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. In fact, Vedic Brahmanism was extremely sensuous and sensual, as the few examples we've talked about already make clear. And only with the pressure exerted from the Buddha and the Mahavira that we had the sense of renunciation. In fact, they also brought it about when they saw so much happening in the society, you know. I mean that too much of, of it was happening. Exactly. Then came up with that. Exactly. But uh, uh, Madhvi, you would also say that um, this uh, free expression of desire, you know, the sexual indulges, indulgences, they often fall in the, you know, they are often described as a, a very Bohemian kind of a lifestyle or maybe the Osho's philosophy. So do you think that we need these cults, you know, if uh, we want to advocate the expression of desire, the indulgences, you know, do, do we have to be in essentially a part of some cult to be doing it? Or <laughs> yeah, but it's a great question, and again goes back to your first question about uh, how regressive we've become. Because uh -huh. we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have needed to belong to any cult to be yeah. sort of openly expressive of our desires, right? Even if you just look at any of the temp set of temple carvings that I talked about earlier, there are multiple configurations of desire. Yes, including yes. including bestiality, for instance. And I keep joking that the desires that on the you know, 11th and 12th century temples are currently almost all illegal in India today. So this sort of shows you how far we have traveled and not in a good way. So yes, absolutely. The consequence or one of the consequences of abnormalizing desire, of making, making various sexual configurations abnormal, is that in order to uh, uh, sort of experience that 
people do have to go to cults or people do have to belong to societies that are not mainstream or that are not frown, or that are frowned upon uh, precisely because they're almost all illegal or they're almost all seen as shady or criminal or whatever it is just goes to show barkha how deeply we have internalized these kinds of moralistic divisions and sometimes i i really really feel that if our uh, ancestors from the 3rd the 4th the 12th the 14th the 16th even the 18th centuries could see us today they would be horrified by how narrow we have become how restricted our horizons have become but would you say these cults they encourage you when they encourage these kind of lifestyles i mean how how would, would you say that's good or okay if you want to find expression it's fine if you are a part of a cult you know barkha actually my problem my pro- not that i've given it much thought but i'm just sort of thinking on my feet because you're asking me this question my problem with cults frankly are not the people who flock to them because many of the people who flock to them are wounded in some way and looking for some kind of solace or hope my that is what i asked my problem with cults is always the cult leader my uh-huh. problem with cults is always inevitably men mm-hmm. inevitably mm-hmm. men pretending to be religious and of course yes. you know the kind of hindu cults in this country almost all of whose heads have been uh, convicted for sexual predatoriness i mean it is quite shocking actually that mm-hmm. but you know so i i am i have deep problems with cult heads or gurus of any kind but mm-hmm. we have to shoulder the blame all of us because mm-hmm. we seem to love this idea of the strong man mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it always has to be a man it always has to be an individual and it mm-hmm. always has to be an individual man who pretends to be a renunciant and i don't need to point very far among our political leaders today to to see you for you to see how many mm-hmm. of those figures are there and so mm-hmm. it, the what is what is wrong with us that that's the kind of symbol we want yeah, i know and i think we all need to ask ourselves as well true true ma'am malvi what would you say i mean about the prevailing conditions in the society in terms of crime against women you know including marital rape would you say that this suppression of desire is all nothing but it's all leading to it you know we try to find so many ways and answers for rape Yeah. Would you yeah. contribute it to this kind of culture that we have, you know, been yeah. brought up? Yeah. I, again, Barkha, as with all your wonderful questions, it's also a big question, and I can only sort of begin to attempt to uh, address it. You know, um, I can join you this. Know, you know, yeah. uh, as you well know, Barkha, marital yeah. rape is not illegal in our country, which is one of uh, the biggest blots uh, against uh-huh. the legal system in India. Uh-huh. marital rape is not illegal precisely because we elevate the idea of marriage to such an extent that we assume that no violence or evil can happen within it despite the overwhelming evidence hmm. that if you count incidents of marital rape india uh-huh. will, will be you know far ahead of any nation in only this one regard of rape um so i i'm i hope the courts will overturn this soon and rewrite the law to make marital rape a crime so that is that is one thing right we don't even no figures for marital rape because it's not even counted as a crime on the one hand yeah on the other hand when you ask about the sort of rape culture that we have now again you know clearly a large part of it uh, is the deeply deeply uh, patriarchal uh, social structures yeah. that we have um, and patriarchy as we know is not just um you know men are evil and women are good patriarchy is about a system that elevates men at the expense of women true and a lot of women are complicit in that structure and so first of all we need to be able to interrupt that game of elevation and devaluation that if we keep elevating men and devaluating women then men are going to be taught over and over again to see women as objects for their pleasure i mean that's a bottom line idea so unless we sort of sort of stop seeing women as objects to be used at will this idea of rape is never going to go away that's sort of one of the things another thing and again you uh, referred to this or indicated this the growing uh, socio economic gap in our country which to my mind is just shocking and has i have been ex- especially exacerbated i think since demonetization since the last two or three years the gap between the rich and the poor is so huge 
that many, many millions of people in our country have mm -hmm. zero inch of what we might call private space to have sex. There mm -hmm. is literally no room mm -hmm. to have sex in. And so that kind of buildup of uh, male frustration mm -hmm. coupled with male entitlement leads mm -hmm. to a potent cocktail of violence. Oh, against women. And, and, and that is just something that has been unleashed in this country. And again, to go back to someone like Vivekananda, his ideas about purity, his ideas about sexuality are deeply misogynistic. And why yeah. only him? Like we can point to anybody and everybody around here. All our leaders, our male leaders today in this country, I would say are deeply misogynistic. And so unless that narrative gets interrupted, I don't see anything changing, Barka. And that is that is what is so sad about the way in which we are going about it. We really have not been able to find out how did this objective, turning a woman into an object from where did it come? How did it start? I, really very difficult to know this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an impossible question, right? How did patriarchy start? I have no idea. But you and I both know on a daily basis how it continues. Yes, yes. And how it was reinforced. Yes. So at the very least, we can at least say interrupting it today will make a difference. Forget yeah. where it came from. We can at least prevent where it's going. Going. Correct, man. Uh, Madhuri, what we have to, you know, we cannot ignore cinema when we speak of desire. Yeah. So uh, this parallel cinema has makes an attempt, you know, to sensitive uh, handle desire very sensitively. They show it through uh, uh, homosexual relationships or extramarital relationships. But the mainstream cinema will use desire only for t the purpose of titillation. Would you agree when I say this? You know, and I mean the way they project desire especially the mainstream? Um, Barkha, Barkha, yes and no, again, okay. which seems to be my favorite answer today. Um, I have some question there also. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are good films and there are bad films. That's true, true. I think bad films are bad on all fronts, including their understanding and depiction of desire. True. I think good films are good on many fronts, including their understanding and depiction of desire. Hmm. I would not, however, classify uh, films that talk openly about homosexuality or openly about adultery as only belonging into the in the camp of good films or good understandings of desire. So, for instance, as you you know might have seen in my in my book as well, um, I'm very interested in seemingly heterosexual narratives mm -hmm. that are actually mm -hmm. what I make term queer, that are actually extremely interesting in how they allow us to think about desire. So one, you know, one film just sort of recently I was thinking about because I was listening to the soundtrack, uh, Ek Mein Aur Ek Tu with, uh, with uh, Karina and, uh, and uh, not, uh, not Ranbir, but what is his name? Hmm. And uh, they, they're two sort of, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, and they do not end up together at the end of the film because they realize they're just very good friends. They love each other, but hmm. not like that. And they go their separate ways. Now, hmm. I found that a really mature understanding of desire a really mature depiction of it, but it's within the realm of heterosexuality. So you mm -hmm. see, for me, it's not the sexual configuration itself that determines sensitivity mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a certain kind of um, openness mm -hmm. to alternative possibilities. Fair so again, to go back to, you know, cinema from the 70s and 80s, if you look at a film like Anand, or you mm -hmm. look at any film that has Amitabh, Shashi, mm -hmm. Dharmendra, Rajesh Khanna, like any of them, Mm -hmm. they all have this sort of male-male um, uh, sexual tension. They all yeah. have male-male desire, even though the men might end up uh, in terms of the narrative with women. So, mm -hmm. but, but you see, they opened up multiple doors for us. Mm -hmm. For me, mm -hmm. that is what is more important, opening up doors mm -hmm. rather than shutting them down. And so, you know, just sort of bad films that talk about desire, I'm not even interested in, even though you're right, there are many of them. But yeah. good films that talk about desire are not easily recognizable in terms of sexual configuration alone, is what I'm trying to say. The society is 
And uh, what is happening is there is a growing uh, female independence now, you know, she has a mind of her own, she has thinking, she has a, she has an option of choice now, you know, of choosing. So do you think that narrative is also reflecting in the cinema now, you know, that we, we don't have films ending with the couple on a nuptial bed, you know, taking a room from there. We have them going the separate ways, they decide, like Queen was a film, uh, which was, is a very good example of that. Rarely do we have these end shots now, you know, of them coming together. So do you think something is happening in that way, you know, that the woman is now getting that option, you know, okay, if she can, she may not end up as your wife or whatever. I think there are very few of those, Barkha, I'm afraid to say. Still very, very few of those. I think films are still overly invested um, mm -hmm. in men and women getting married yeah. in the woman cooking at home of the home of her in-laws after getting married or mm. changing the way she dresses. I, I really think films are still much too invested in that. Um, mm. So yes, of course, there have been some uh, windows, some oxygen that has been injected into these narratives, uh, but mm. we need a lot more if for us to actually see any difference. All right. This is one question which I need to put to you, this right growing influence, you know, of anti-Majnu laws, love jihad, how do you think it's going to work for this society, you know, when on the one end, the society is opening up, the girls have a choice of live in relationships, there is, you know, homosexuality has been legalized, people are coming out with their relationships now. And in this time and in this era, instead of promoting them, handholding them, encouraging them, we suddenly have this love jihad thing, states legislating laws now anti majnu laws, you know, the couples can't, anti-Valentine Day, these protest. Uh, where, where will it take, uh, take this society? What do you say? Uh, uh, Barkha, to, to hell. I mean, <laughs> in, in a word. Uh, it is um, heartbreaking. That's the only word I have to use. It is heartbreaking to see the uh, viciousness with which a certain kind of desire is being um, promoted. Huh. And as I said, the desire that is being promoted is not only deeply communal, but also yeah. deeply misogynistic. Yeah. And as you know, the ordinance that was recently passed by the Uttar Pradesh cabinet last week makes very clear that for them, women cannot choose. That women have no sense of desire because the point of the law is to protect women from men and they don't specify this in the law, of course, but they're given the uh, political caste of that government in Uttar Pradesh, we know that their idea is to protect Hindu women against Muslim men. And so to my mind, this is a dangerous game that the politicians are playing. And it is up to us to call this out because the idea that women cannot fall in love with who they want to, that women cannot know their desires, that religion actually impedes desire is a deeply, deeply problematic assumption. And unless, and I really hope that once it becomes law, it actually gets overturned because it is absolutely against the constitution. It is flagrantly uh, extra uh, legal against the constitution. And more than that, Arka, it's against the ethos of the India we've just been talking about. It's against the ethos of the centuries of ideas and ways of life that we have lived uh, that have no, there's been no phrase or term or word precisely because desire has never been so misogynistically, narrowly and phobically understood as it is today. And so when you said just now, are things opening up and changing? Just look at our politicians and our laws. I, mean, I, don't, I think we are regressing. We are being hurtled back into a time that I had thought, you had thought, we had hoped we were emerging from. But in, who's going to protest this? The moment somebody protests these kind of laws, they are branded as immoral, preaching immorality. And so, I, uh, uh, huh. so he, who's going to check this? Do you do you think there, there is any way that we can protest this or bring a change? You know, but the what I am the the plea, the people I am most uh, disappointed by in mm. India today. Mm are people like you and me, which is the middle classes of India. Okay. We have to be the ones protesting. We have to be the ones picking up the baton. Because just look, at, for instance, where I'm sitting right now today in Delhi, look at the onslaught of farmers on the capital city of this country. 
Look at the onslaught that students mounted against the CAA. Look at the onslaught that Muslim women and Dalit women have stood up, you know, against law after law after law. It's people like us who sit silently. And yes, you're absolutely right. If we remain silent, it's because the, uh, the atmosphere of fear is all pervasive. But we have to be the ones to pick up the baton. We have to unite, we have to organize, and we have to say no more. You cannot go further in eroding our civil liberties and eroding our sense of ourselves. People who have much, much more to lose than we do, students, farmers, Muslim women, all of them have agitated. It is our turn and we need to step up. And this is happening when, you know, the society was just about, you know, had begun to accept uh, intercaste marriages, intercommunity marriages. It's happening at that time, you know, and uh, do you, and we, you know, in fact, intermarriage, uh, some of the divorces are being celebrated. I mean, I won't name any, that we, you know, you know, that, uh, uh, so how do you think this is, uh, I mean, we are sure that it's going to have a very, very negative impact on the way we progress and the way we uh, conduct ourselves. Okay, thank you very much, Madhavi, for this lovely chat we have had with you. Oh, lovely. Thank you, Barbara. I'm sure the audience has also enjoyed. Prachi, what do you say? Yes, ma'am. It was a very good session. Oh, you enjoyed. How many audio? How, tell us the number of audience who were there listening to it. Ma'am, I don't know because I'm not live on YouTube. Oh. I have to check it. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Madhavi. Enjoy you, your next Thank session. Thank you, Thank you so Thank you. much. Thanks very much. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for this wonderful session, Madhavi Ma'am. It was a pleasure having you today for the topic. I also want to give thanks to Bharka Mathur Ma'am for moderating the session. I personally loved your session, Ma'am. It was amazing listening to you both. Also, I extend my gratitude to the publisher Speaking Tiger. On behalf of Orange City Literature Fest, we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. Our next session for the day is by Mr. Salman Khurshid on the topic, The Surprising Attitude Towards Literacy of Leaders. Can we, Rachi, can we leave the meeting? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Twenty years of existence, two universities, 23 educational institutes, offering 137 courses, Rai Sony Group of Institutions, a vision beyond.